Welcome to Calvary Online. My name is Aaron, and I'm the pastor of student and worship ministries here at Calvary. And at Calvary, our desire is to see everyone become disciples of Jesus. We want to see people uh, become outwardly focused Christ followers who passionately pursue a love for God and a love for others, and also to be disciples who make disciples. If this is your first time watching our online service or you've been watching uh, for the last eight months, we just want to give you a warm welcome to our service this morning. Our call to worship this morning comes from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. And it says, But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love, made you alive in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved. What this verse tells us is that uh, because of God's mercy, he is the one who saved us and he actually made us alive in Christ. He has taken us from spiritually dead to spiritually alive. Uh, as Christians, we uh, our whole lives are a response to who God is and that's what we call worship. And this morning we have an opportunity to worship God, to respond to who he is because of what he has done uh, and who he is. And so the first song we're going to be singing, we haven't sung in quite a while, uh, but it's Made Alive. And, and Made Alive is, is really a song about Ephesians 2. Uh, again, and it talks about uh, us being made alive in Christ. And so would you join us this morning as we respond to who God is and what he's done in Jesus. was dead in sin, alone and hopeless. A child of wrath, I walked condemned in darkness. But your mercy brought new life, and in your love and kindness raised me up with Christ and made me righteous you have brought me back with the riches of your amazing grace and relentless love I made alive forever with you life forever by your grace I'm saved and Lord you are the light that broke the darkness Satisfy my soul when I am heartless. If ever I forget my true identity, show me who I am and help me to believe that you have brought me back with the riches of your amazing grace and relentless love. I'm Sin has been erased. I'll never be the same. My sin has been erased. I'll never be the same. Cause you have bought me back with the riches of your amazing grace and relentless love. I This next song is our new one for November. Yeah, it is November. Just had to make sure. 
uh, and it's a song called Goodness of God. Uh, and this song has been uh, just an anthem for me over the last number of weeks. It speaks of God's faithfulness and of God's goodness. Uh, and this is a time when sometimes we can question that. We can, we can question God's faithfulness and God's goodness. Uh, but I love this song because it, it allows us to declare God's goodness and God's faithfulness. And so would you join us as we sing Goodness of God. everyone. My name is Heather and I am on the worship team here at Calvary. And I just want to take a minute. Uh, we're going to pause the video for a second uh, to pray for our partnership with International Student Ministries Canada. We would like you to pray specifically for the students who are stuck in Canada and can't go back home because of COVID and also the students who are not able to come back to school this year. 
Uh, please pray that God would continue to open doors for International Student Ministries Canada to be able to reach the lives of our international students both here in Canada and again those who weren't able to come back. This morning's scripture comes to us from Matthew 5, 13 to 16, and it says, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, and thank you for joining us on Calvary Online. Thank you for being part of our worship time together. Thank you for just helping us to uh, praise the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And today, we're going to continue looking at holiness. Uh, this is week seven in our series on holiness. And today, we're going to focus in on holiness in an unholy world. Because we have a challenge. We have a challenge that we are called to live out our holiness in a world around us that doesn't actually always want to be holy. And that might be a surprise to you. But there are a number of things going on in the world around us that are unholy, but God still says, be holy for I am holy. And so what does it look like for us to live out holiness in an unholy world? When we say the world, of course, we think of the globe, the big blue marble, and we think of the continents and the water, and we think of that side, we think of the nature side, but also we think of the people side because we are the inhabitants of the earth and we're the ones who make up the population of the earth and we are the ones who are created in God's image. So when I think of the earth, I think of both. And I've been very blessed to see some incredible things around the world, uh, some mountains and seas and oceans and jungles. And I've been more blessed to meet some incredible people around the world and just to see, uh, to see their love and, and to feel their welcome and and just to be a part of what God is doing in their lives. And so I've been very blessed by that. And, and so when we look at the world, the question becomes, how do we view the world? How is our view of the world formed? And that can be a couple different ways. I'm going to go through four of them. I'm going to look at four different ways that the world can be viewed. And then in your discussion questions, I invite you to think of some more ways that we view the world. And, and one of the first ways that often that we in the church, people who are followers of Jesus, view the world is this. It's a temporary resting place. Years ago when I worked at Camp Minioi, we used to sing a song that said, this world is not my home, I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open doors and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. It's a temporary resting place. I was born in Canada. My passport says Canadian. Uh, later on today, this message is gonna be shared with the Mandarin congregation. Many of them, their passports say China. And that is their citizenship on earth but my citizenship is in heaven. And the challenge with that, if this is, you know, that I'm not going to be here very long, some people say, well, I, I might as well just be here for a good time if I'm not here for a long time. I'm going back to the song from the 70s, right? And, and the idea that this is just a temporary resting place, and so I don't have to really be all that worried about being holy because I'm going to be holy when I go up to the Father, when I pass on here, when I've passed through, I'm going to be holy for all eternity. So there's that challenge. Some people don't really think that they have to take care of the earth or that they have to live a holy life here. And so is it a temporary resting place? Yes, but that's only while I am here doing what God has called me to do so that I can serve. Many times in the church, we also view the world as evil. And you don't have to look very far. You don't have to look very far on the news, online, in our own communities to find things going on that are evil, things that are beyond redemption. And in the midst of that evil, we are still called to live a holy life. What does it look like for me to live a holy life in the midst of that evil? To stand up against injustice. Those are kind of the things that we talk about. And, and depending, I think, if you're a glass half empty kind of person, you might tend to see the evil a lot more than you see the good, right? And you'll see the evil and, and we can become fixated on it. We can become afraid of it or we can know and understand that God is still calling us to live out a holy life in the midst of it so that we can, so that we can be a part of this world and that we can make a difference. And if there is evil in the world, there is also beauty, right? There's that which is evil and there is good. And so I think of beauty, beautiful. It's a beautiful world. 
you know, and, and I've, like I said, I've seen some incredible things. I've, I've been to some incredible places and met some wonderful people who are just, who, who were just, you know, uh, when I was in Columbia, they didn't have a lot, but what they had, they shared freely and they just loved and they just loved. And, and the folks that we worked with, the Haitians that we worked with uh, on a bunch of trips that I took to Dominican, Haitians had crossed the border. And, and again, they didn't have much, but they opened their arms and they opened their homes to us. They invited us in. You know, they wanted to serve us a meal when they could barely scrape anything together because they just cared and they were these beautiful people. And I think there's a real beauty in the earth. And that sometimes it's much easier to live out that holy lifestyle that God calls us to when we start to see the beauty and we start to see God's creation and the beauty in it. So moving ahead. But then we also see the world. We, we see that, you know, that it's a, pa- a place that we're passing through. It's a stopping place. We see the evil. We see the beauty. But then we also see that folks are lost. You know, and, and God's creation, his people that are formed in his image are lost. And they're living an unholy life. And many of them don't even understand the extent of their lostness. Many don't understand that, that there's something missing. They are haunted I think a lot of our, a lot of our, uh, the contemporary people around us, we are haunted by what we are missing. Somewhere deep inside of us, there's a longing that we want to fill, but we can't. And so we try all these other ways. People of the world try all these other ways to fill that hole. And some of them are, some of them are destructive and some of them are fantastic. They're helping. They're doing great things that make the world a better place. But it's out of a sense of trying to be found trying to fill that lostness. And in the midst of a world that is a temporary resting place, that does experience evil, but has incredible beauty, and a world that is lost, God calls us to live a holy life. And how we view the world impacts how we interact with it. So we're just going to go through, we're going to look a little bit at what the world is like, and then we're going to look at five ways that, that I've experienced and that others around me have experienced to help us live that holy life in an unholy world. First of all, we need to understand that it is God's creation. God formed the world. If you read Genesis chapter one and chapter two, that's the story of creation. And it's very interesting because God said, let there be, happens a number of different times. That's the repeating, that's the way a lot of the verses said, that the way that they start, it goes, and God said, let there be light. And God said, let there be light. The, wa- the waters. And God said, let there be land which will separate the waters. Then God said, let there be animals which will roam upon the land. And God said, let there be fish in the sea. And, and God said, and God spoke the word into creation. Psalm 33, Psalm chapter 33, verses six to nine, tells us, it just kind of very poetically points back to what God has done. And it says this, By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their host. He gathers the water of the sea as a heap. He puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. So we see that this is God's creation. And when God created, if you continue reading in Genesis, uh, the first few chapters of Genesis, one, two, and three, we see how he creates man and, and how they were holy. And there was no shame, there's no guilt. And how God had created them for a holy relationship with him. It says in the cool of the evening, God would come down and he would walk in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. And he would spend time with him. You know, we have the song, I come to the garden alone and he walks with me and he talks with me. And he tells me I'm his own. And so we see God in creation. We were created to be in a holy relationship with him. But then stuff went sideways. Stuff went sideways. And the world starts to experience the pain of brokenness and sin. And we experience the broken relationship that we had with God. Where before we were in this holy union with him. God would come down and walk with with mankind, with Adam and Eve and with man and with woman and he would spend time with them and they would spend time in his very presence and they would feel that love and that care and that concern and they they would have the truest sense of a pure and biblical father who loved them and it was holy and it was pure and it was beautiful 
And then sin entered the world. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. No, yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgressions of Adam, who was the type of the one who was to come. And so pain and brokenness and sin entered into the world and we went from living this holy life to living ones where we must strive after holiness to see the difference. Before we experienced sin and brokenness, it was holy and now we long to experience, we long to go from the sin and the brokenness that we have towards holiness, to be in that relationship with God. And so God calls us into that. And the challenge is there are things around us there are things around us that keep us from living that holy life. The sinful things, the, the brokenness in the world around us keep us from living that sinful life. But we're, and we're called to be a part of the world that is around us. John 17, 13 to 19 says clearly, but now I'm coming to you. And this is Jesus speaking. Jesus is talking and he says, and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. God, Jesus, uh, God has given us Jesus and Jesus wants us to have that joy fulfilled in our lives. That sense of holy union, once again, that's the way we get that fulfillment, living that holy life in an unholy world and, and walking with Jesus. And then he says this, I've given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world just as I am not of this world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Don't take them out of the world. Keep them in the world, but protect them from the evil one. Why would Jesus want us to stay in this world? Because we are called to be a part of it. So as we'll see in a few minutes, how we can impact and we can be people who bring change and we can bring people who bring hope and joy by living that holy life. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they may also be sanctified in truth. And so Christ is sending us into the world. I remember watching uh, a documentary on Powell, who was the, the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff when the second Iraq war occurred. I believe it was the second one. He was the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And he sent hundreds of men, uh, thousands of men into combat. He sent American troops across the ocean to go into fight. And he sent them for specific purpose to go in to bring freedom. Right, to go and to try to uh, fight against some of the evil that was inherent in the world. In the same way, Jesus sends us to live a holy life in an unholy world so that we can make a difference. And as we're doing that, the temptation is to eventually just start floating along and going the way that the world wants us to go. But James chapter 1, verse 27 clearly tells us about how we are to live that holy life. And it says this, brothers and sisters, a religion that God our Father considers pure and faultless is this, to look after widows and orphans in their distress. So that's the sending part. Widows and orphans at the time, they were uh, there at the bottom of the pecking order. They had no one to watch out for them. Uh, if you were married, uh, if, if Anna and I were married back in Bible times and I passed away, any possessions and property I had would go to our sons, and Anna would have nothing, and then the sons were to take care of her. If we didn't have sons, it would go back to my family. And you could hope that your in-laws would look after you, uh, so that, and then maybe at some point you could remarry, but you could very easily be destitute. And orphans who had nobody to look out for them. And so James is saying, pure religion is to be involved in the world around us. Uh, right now I'm reading a book, I've just actually finished, and it's called The Glory of Preaching. I meet with a group of senior pastors from across Canada and we get together on Zoom once a month. We were supposed to get together for a retreat. We were gonna all meet in Calgary halfway and that didn't happen. But we've been reading this book called The Glory of Preaching and this chapter is called The Life of the Preacher and, and that they must live in suffering. They must live in the word of God. They must live in other books about theology and about Christian faith. And it says we must live in culture. So this is specifically speaking to the preacher but I think it works for all of us. It says this, the life of the preacher is lived in the culture. Actually, it is impossible not to do so unless one wants to be a hermit out in the hills. 
we cannot help but drink the water of the particular culture in which God has placed us. As theologian Karl Barth is known for saying, we live with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. We do need to see movies, listen to music, read what people are writing, attend concerts, listen to debates, to debates, go to sporting events, coach little league or soccer. Such activity automa- automatically helps us connect and helps us speak in ways that connect. But we are not to live in culture at the expense of living in the inbreaking kingdom, a culture itself too. And our desire to connect is it, is it is easy to fall in, so to speak, and no longer have any unique word to speak to the culture. Do not let the world around you squeeze you into its mold, said J.B. Phillips. The idea that we have to be involved in the culture around us, that we are not to just abandon it and, and to get together in, in our little circles where we, where we exclude people who so desperately uh, need to see someone living a holy life in front of them. To be, as we're going to see in a few minutes, to be on mission to go out and to be focused on being a part of this world, not being conforming to the patterns of this world, but by being a part of the world so that we can speak into it and we can live a holy life in front of others in an unholy land. And we are called to be agents of preservation and change. And this is what Jesus is sending us to do. And this is what was read for us, the scripture that was read, that we are called to be both salt and light. And the idea that we are to actually to, to preserve the world. Uh, I have a really simple way of preserving things. I go and I buy it at the grocery store and I bring it home and I put it in the fridge or I put it in the freezer. Put it in the fridge, it's good for days. Put it in the freezer, it's good for months. Uh, when we buy things that are prepackaged, we can leave them on the shelf in the pantry for weeks, if not years. Years ago, we did a, a fundraiser. It was a, it was a a food drive. We went door to door at Halloween. Halloween's coming up and we, or we've actually just had Halloween. And so uh, we went door to door and we collected thousands of pounds of food and people would clear out their pantries to give it to us. And we found someone gave us a cake mix that was like 12 years old, right? We, we didn't pass that one on. That one went in the garbage when we sorted, but we can have food that it lasts for a long time. Back in Bible times, when Jesus saying that you are to be the salt of the earth, Right? And, and he's calling them to do that because it preserves. They would salt the meat. They would salt their fish. And they could preserve it that way. They could make it last longer. I believe with all my heart, I believe with all that I am, that the world is in the state that it is in. The positive things that we see in the world today are, can, a lot of them can be traced directly to followers of Jesus who are living holy lifestyles, pleasing to God in an unholy world. We are acting as preservation. We are keeping and preserving society around us by being in it and being involved in it. And then we are acting as light. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. You know, the city on a hill, Heather read for us, cannot be hidden. Rather, you take light, you put it on a lampstand so it gives illumination to everything. If we are living that holy life, if we are being the people God is calling us to be from Matthew 5, 13 to 16, then we will actually, we will experience what it means for us to be light. And it's funny because you just turn on a light and it shows stuff, right? The light, the job of the light is to illuminate not to make judgment. And so we just need to learn to shine our light in such a way that we are illuminating, that we are bringing brightness, that we are bringing preservation to that which is around us. So there's five ways I found to do this. Five ways that I found personally that, that other folks I know have done. Uh, in, your, in your discussion questions after, if you've got more, share them. You know, share them with each other and talk about ways to actually live a holy life in an unholy world. And one of the first ones that I've always found is this, a public identification with Jesus. I have it pretty easy when it comes down to it, because one of the first things people always ask you when you meet them is, what do you do for a living? And I say, well, actually, I'm a pastor and I work at a church and I help people uh, find hope and I help people find and develop a relationship with Jesus. And sometimes that ends the conversation pretty quick, but I'm able to publicly identify with Jesus pretty quickly as soon as someone gets to meet me, right? And because that's the first question they always ask. There are other ways to publicly identify with Jesus. You know, there's a whole bunch of them. Uh, I know of folks who uh, will wear uh, Christian t-shirts, 
or a sweater or something. A friend of mine planted a church and he really wanted a shirt that talked about Jesus. So it it was, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He got a whole bunch of them printed up and a bunch of people wore them around Sudbury. And the gospel was shared and people were making a proclamation of who they were. There are folks who will keep at their office, if you work in an office, there are folks who will keep a Bible on their desk, right? And so that people can see that there's a Bible there. Uh, when people ask you, when I, when I worked for a year in the hospital in Sudbury, uh, when people would say to me on Monday, if I was in on a shift on Monday, and they'd say, what'd you do on the weekend? I'd say, well, I had to work on Saturday at 10 to 2, and then, you know, we went for a walk with our son, my wife and I, and then we went to church on Sunday. And oh, and that was just another way that I can identify with Jesus, that I can, that I can publicly proclaim that I am a follower of Christ. And without doing it in such a way that, that, compromises and comes across as being aggressive because the next thing we want to do is be able to give a gracious proclamation of your faith. And the more that I've learned to do this, make a public identification with Jesus, the more I've discovered that people will ask me, what do I believe? And specifically in my role, they say, what made you choose to be a pastor? What made you choose to work in a church for God? And that's the opening. That's the opening right there. When someone says, oh, well, why did you go to church on Sunday? You know, well, you know, why, why do you go to help out with the youth group, go and serve at a youth group on Wednesday night? Why do you go and serve at a soup kitchen? And I say things like, well, I've, I've found that in my own life. You know, I found in my own life that I, I couldn't find peace and I couldn't find contentment. I couldn't find joy. And that's the things that we we're looking for. And I found that when I started paying attention to Jesus and I came into a relationship with Jesus and, and I found someone to walk with me and I take, you know, to walk with me through trials of life that come. And I take an opportunity to make a gracious proclamation of my faith when they ask me. And eventually, eventually, if I'm in a relationship with someone long enough, they almost always ask. I've only had one or two people who have flat out shut it down. No, don't want to hear about that. And that's fine. Okay, God bless you. Let's keep doing what we're doing. You know, no, let's not do that. Let's just keep doing this and, and let's whatever. And that's fine, but it's a gracious proclamation of your faith. When you illuminate, when you are light, when you are salt and you preserve, salt isn't aggressive. You, you know, salt doesn't attack, salt preserves. Light just illuminates. And so when we illuminate and then we're asked, we can give a gracious proclamation of our faith. Next one is this, focusing on prioritizing the mission. Uh, You know, uh, when Aaron started this service, he shared how here at Calvary, we want to see everyone a disciple and that we are called to be uh, passionate, outwardly focused followers of Christ, passionately pursuing the great commandment and the great commitment, loving God, loving others, and making disciples who make disciples. That's the mission God has given us here at Calvary. A lot of churches have something similar. The idea that we're not just here for ourselves. We are here to go out and to do something. And if I'm living a holy life and I'm focused on that mission, first of all, it takes away a lot of time that I might have to do unholy things if I'm learning to focus on that mission. But it's also creating patterns in my life of prioritizing what God has for us as his people. And so I focus on prioritizing the mission. If I am just passing through here, let me do all the good that I can do while I'm here because I may never pass this way again. And as we're passing through, we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to make a difference and to share and to, to help change the context of who and where we are. Next one is this, the continued, this is the fourth one, the continued intake of the word of God. If I want to live a holy life in an unholy world, then I cannot do that apart from the Holy Spirit uh, teaching me and revealing to me things through the Word of God. Right? I can just read the book. You know, I can go through, I can go through there's 66 books in the Protestant Bible, and you know, if it's a Catholic Bible, there's a few more, and I can go through those and I can read these. But it's not until I actually take the time, like we talked about a few weeks ago, to study and to, to meditate on and to memorize and to have a continued intake, a steady diet of the word of God, because that is the only way that I'm going to be able to continue to grow and to be strengthened in my inner spirit, like we talked about last week, to be who God calls me to be, to be able to resist the temptations around me. And the fifth one is this, and this this could be a real challenge. 
Because if I am living in an unholy world, there are times where I might end up finding myself in an incredibly unholy situation. Am I in a job where I'm constantly asked to do that which is unethical, immoral, or illegal? And that's the expectation, right? Do I have to lie and cheat and falsify and steal to get ahead in my occupation? Then I might need to seriously reconsider what I am doing and move to something else. A friend of mine used to play for the Toronto Maple Leafs. It was sad. He came up through the Montreal farm system and he was all ready to play for the Canadians. And I think he did for a bit and got traded to the Leafs. And, and he actually was an enforcer. And he came to faith. And, and so he was actually in Bible college, had to tell the prof, I'm going to be gone for a few days because I'm going on a road trip. And he's, oh, what do you do? Well, I play for the Leafs. And as an enforcer, though, he had to fight. And he had come to faith and, and an organization called Hockey Ministries International approached him and said, hey, could we put your picture on a Christmas card that we're going to send to all the CHL players? So that's like OHL, like the Eastern Hockey League, the Western Hockey League, and all NHL players. You know, all these guys are going to receive a Christmas card with your picture on. He said, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Then he was in a game and, and some guy hit him pretty hard and gave him a cheap shot. And he's coming after him. He's laying the lumber on. He's like, let's go, let's go, let's fight. And the guy turned around and looked at him and said, I could never fight someone who sent me a Christmas card. And my buddy stopped dead, stopped cold. And he skated off. If he was done his shift, he skated off the ice. He finished the game. And he went to the GM and he resigned. And he retired from professional hockey. Because he realized that, that he was damaging his witness. And living the way that it was calling him, the way that he was when he played was damaging his witness and keeping him from fulfilling uh, and from leading the holy life God was calling him to, to lead in an unholy world. So we have these challenges that we must move possibly to a new situation. You might need, you know, in, you might need to consider uh, your living situation if you're living in dorm. I know a number of Christian students who have chosen that they don't want to live in dorm because they're worried that they will not be able to live a holy life with all the unholiness going, around, going on around them. So we might be required to find a new situation so that we can live in a holy life. We don't shut those people out of our life. We want to still be able to reach out and to, to love and to care for them. But if being in close quarters in this situation like that is keeping us from living the holy life and it's damaging our ability to be salt and light, we might need to think of being somewhere else. You know, we started off with this image of the world. We started off with the image of the big blue marble and the idea that, that God created it. And oftentimes, uh, there are one of the other ways that we often will view the world is that God created it in Genesis and he started it spinning and then he pulled out and he's an absentee landlord, that he's gone. But the same God who calls us to, leave, to live a holy life in an unholy world is the God who is holding that world, who is sustaining that world, who will never leave us nor forsake us. The challenge for us is to continue leading that life, the holy life he calls us to, in the midst of an unholy world, following after what Christ has, so we can see everyone a disciple. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for Jesus and for the way that he has just given us a mission and sent us to this world. He asked you to protect us, Father, in this world from the evil one so that we can continue to live a holy life, a life of change and impact, of preservation and enlighten, enlightening those around us and shining the light and the love of Jesus Christ. Father, there are some things in this that are challenging. There are things in this that might require us to give up, to set aside, to reprioritize so that we can be focused on the mission. And so, Father, I pray that you will just, as we move through some of these things and living in a whole, that holy life, that, Father, you will strengthen us to that purpose, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, right now, I'm just going to invite you, if you'd like, to join us for a time of communion. Uh, communion, the Lord's table, the Lord's supper, the Eucharist, whatever you might have heard it called, uh, we celebrate communion with anyone who joyfully proclaims Jesus Christ as Lord. Don't have to be a member of our church to, joy, to enjoy and to join us in communion as we remember what Christ has done for us. Oftentimes, we read 1 Corinthians 11, and that's how Paul talks about communion. And, but today, I actually want to go to Luke chapter 22. 
And this is Jesus himself when he institutes the Lord's Supper. And notice the words that he uses here. Uh, he, he says this, and when the hour had come, in verse 14, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Earnestly wanting to spend time and to pour into them and, and to give them something to remember and to give something that would empower them. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom. And he took a cup and when he'd given thanks, he said, take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not eat or drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. So if you're at home and you're taking communion, I invite you right now to drink with us. And then it says in verse 19, and he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance for me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup is poured out for you is the covenant in my blood. And then he invites us to eat. And then he says this, verse 21, but behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the son of man goes that has been determined, but woe to the man by whom he's betrayed. And they begin to question one another, which of them it could be who's going to do this. And so Jesus has just demonstrated the incredible power of love that he's actually served communion to Judas who will betray him. We take the bread and we take the cup and we drink to remember and to honor his death until he comes again. It says in 1 Corinthians 11. But also when we do this, it is an act of love and of remembrance and of proclamation of the forgiveness and the hope that Jesus Christ brings. Thank you for joining with us in communion. Let's just pray. So Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the sacrifices that he has made for us. And God, as, as we are uh, mindful that we do this to, re re to remember his death, but we also remember his resurrection and the power that he offers us, the hope and the call to us to walk that life with him, a holy life pleasing to God. In your name we pray, amen. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold my Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark. Forsaken, for by my side the Savior He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need His power is displayed. To this I hold my shepherd. I hold my sin has been
Just as we're concluding here, there's a few things that I want to let you know about opportunities where you can serve to help build the kingdom of God. A couple things that we're really excited about coming up. November the 15th, we have our second Calvary Kids Sunday. Uh, we, had one, we had one in October, and it was just amazing. There was families spread out across the gym, and people actually were social distancing. Every once in a while, a little guy or a little gal would go running off, and mom and dad would scoop them up. But we had social distancing, but we had uh, special guests. We had an opportunity to pray together and to sing and to worship and, and to play together and to talk and discuss and to grow together. So our next one is coming up on November the 15th. So please watch so you can sign up for that. And if you don't have a young family, there is still plenty of room, uh, chairs across the back. We had about a dozen people join us who didn't have young families. And it was great to see the young and the young at heart celebrating and worshiping God together. Right now, if you'd like to celebrate and worship God with uh, young folks, you can go to, with your children, you can go to our video that Christina puts up every week. Our Calvary Kids video is up live. You can go and you can watch that and you can just be part of our, like our kids program at home, Calvary Kids Online. Uh, when we talk about being online, one of the ways that we join and connect together online is through giving. And we are very grateful, very thankful for, for the folks who have continued, for many of you have continued to give uh, as you are able during this time of COVID. Uh, there's a bunch of different ways. If you go to our website and you click on the giving tab, there's a bunch of different ways that you can give. The one that helps us the most is if you sign up for automatic withdrawal and you can have those forms sent to you so you can fill out that process. But we can give online securely through Canada Helps. Uh, just incredible way to keep what's going on here at the church funded. So we're very thankful for you guys for doing that. And then December the 27th is our end of the year service. Uh, for the last number of uh, years, on the final Sunday of the year, what we've done is we've had a big prayer and sharing service. And because of all the COVID restrictions, uh, we still want to do it, but we realize that we can't do it live. So December the 27th, December 27th, two days after Christmas, uh, we will be online. Everybody will be online. And what we're asking, if you'd like to send in a video of something that God has taught you, uh, like a little update on what God has taught you through COVID. You know, the way that you've moved through and how God has spoken to you. Uh, send that in. And if you're interested, you can either go to our website or you can go to our app and you can register. And when you do that, you'll get all the information about how to shoot the video, who to send it to, all that stuff. But we'll be editing. We'll be cutting it all together with worship. And we're going to have a wonderful time of praising God. But we can do that from our homes. And we can actually experience the fullness of our whole church body coming together. And we'd love you to be a part of that. Right now, I'm just going to ask you if you can join me in saying our sending scripture, and it is from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 to 16. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, 
you shall be holy, for I am holy. God bless you, Calvary. Thanks for joining us for Calvary Online, and we will see you next week.